The views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times, if it's time, rise up, rise up. When death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up. When famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord's anger is no longer feared, if his protection is gone and your enemies are near, if you've seen the seas spill over and the mountains shake, break, and fall, if the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all, rise up, no matter if the prize is high and welcome to New Abolitionist Radio on the Black Talk Radio Network, a program that seeks to educate, inform, and agitate on the issue of 21st century legalized slavery. Hosted by social activist and spoken word poet Max Parthas with new abolitionist and currently MIA actionist Johanna Elia and Black Talk Media Project founder Scotty Reed. On this program, we discuss recent news on legalized 21st century slavery and human trafficking along with projects and people who help combat it. Today is the May 17th, 2017 broadcast of New Abolitionist Radio. And the race war has officially been reinstated in full under cover of law with A.G. Jeff Sessions' prosecutorial memo to seek the maximum charges in all drug cases. That nickel bag of weed might get you life in prison nowadays. On this day, in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a unanimous decision in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, ruling that racial segregation in public educational facilities is unconstitutional. And just last month, on April 28th, Gardendale, Alabama, legally went right back to segregated schools. Constitution be damned. Events in regards to the U.S. legalized slave system are unfolding at record rates. Our storyboard for tonight is overwhelmingly full. It would be impossible to cover it all. So we'll share what time allows during the broadcast, and provide links to the stories we can't fit today. Be sure to follow us on New Abolitionist Radio on Facebook so you can stay abreast. Just the events I've personally been involved with this week could fill the whole program, so let's not waste too much time. Our abolitionist and profile will be provided by Scotty Reed. Our rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad is Isaiah McCoy, a death row prisoner for years, who on January 20th, 2017, walked out of the Howard R. Young Correctional Institution in Wilmington a free man after a judge found him not guilty of murder in his second trial. And in our new segment, For Freedom's Sake, A History of Rebellion, we will be remembering the German Coast Slave Uprising of 1811, which is regarded by some historians as the largest revolt of its sort in American history. Have a question or a comment? You can call us at toll-free at uh, 1-866-510-9025. That's 866-510-9025. You can also chat with us and others by logging in at uberconference.com slash Black Talk Radio Network. Once again, I'm Max Parthas. What's happening, Brother Scotty? How you doing, man? Hey, I'm slow, but I'm show, like my uncle used to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't have... Um, too many complaints except for the complaining I'm about to do in the next two hours about modern day slavery and human trafficking but I do want to acknowledge you know the release of your own son from modern day slavery mm. uh, welcome home uh, to him and also congratulations to you for your humanitarian award that you recently received 
Thank you, Scotty. Yeah, it's been a hell of an emotional roller coaster week for me and our family, man. Just so many things have occurred. Um, and, and not not bad, but good things, because, you know, we've been dealing with some real tragedies over the past couple of years. But to know that my son is out finally and walking free, that is uh, just, oh, man. I can't wait till I physically get to see him. He's in Jersey now, as I said last, I think last week. And today the probation officer came to my house to inspect the house to make sure that we have, you know, proper place for him to be able to stay. So within the next month, I guess we'll finally get together, a uh, father and son reunion. And then to today, Scotty, I got to see my granddaughter's face for the first time since she was an infant. His daughter, she was born on my birthday. Uh, just shortly before he went into prison. And the mother uh, took child and, and disappeared. I didn't know where they were. My wife and I tried to find them for years, and we couldn't. So I hadn't seen her since she was an infant. And now she's a 14-year-old girl, and she is just gorgeous. I, I saw her face today, so I'm looking forward to that reunion as well. It's just awesome, man. And, uh, yeah, the, the I just received a uh, humanitarian award from the Spoken Word community in the fifth annual Spoken Word Gala. And that was pretty amazing, too. Uh, hopefully, it, in the near future, there'll be videos and stuff like that out. But there are photos and everything. It was very, very, very nice. Very nice. The only thing that messed up the evening was the racism that was involved. And it wasn't the type of racism where people are there doing racist acts. The racism we saw that night was due to the fact, I guess, that all of the awardees were people of color. Nobody in the white community showed up at all. Not one person. So, um, it, okay, I get you. I get what you mean. Well, you know, that's a shame, um, you know, that they don't participate in that, um, that activity. So, I do want to go ahead and let people know that Max has, we're pretty much going to be in fleet, free flow tonight. Of course, we have stories to share. I definitely want to talk about uh, Sheriff David Clark Jr., the Milwaukee sheriff, who has several deaths under his belt uh, while overseeing that jail. Um, but he is apparently about to be bailed out by Donald Trump and given a job with Homeland Security. So I do want to talk about that. I know the people of Milwaukee County will be happy that he's leaving, but I don't think there's anything to be happy about the position that he now will get. And I have to look it up and see what his exact job title will be with Homeland Security. But yes, he's joining the Trump administration um, after um, many, many months of him, I guess, you know, wondering if they was going to give him a job or not after he, you know, pretty much went out with to bat for Donald Trump during the uh, Republican primaries and the general election. So tonight is pretty much free flow. So if any other listeners out there, if y'all have anything you would like for us to to uh, touch upon, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Again, that number is 866-510-9025. Hit star star if you're on the board. Once you dialed in, that will unmute you. Um, um, I will see you on the board, and I will uh, bring you into this live broadcast, a new abolitionist radio. So we're in free flow tonight, except for our regular segments, which Max just laid out for you. Um, that will come towards the end of tonight's broadcast, a new abolitionist radio. Max, I had to laugh, man. I was over here laughing out, <laughs> laughing out loud when you said, Johan and Elijah. <laughs> M.I.A. <laughs> M.I.A. <laughs> but we know he is not M.I.A. by choice. So <laughs> no, not just, by choice, man. Let's He's make handling that clear. business. He got to take care of life right now. And uh, we will be here when it's all done for him. There's no doubt about that. That brother is part of this team. Always has been, always will be. Mo most yeah, man. Um, when we say freestyle, though, you know, it means that we just got so damn many stories that we're just going to pick them at random, whatever we feel is necessary at the time and fits in with the flow. And if you want to call in and add your voice and, and add some stuff, feel free. Yeah, I believe uh, Otis wanted me to cover a video 
he wanted me to bring it up tonight. And I can see how I can fit that into the context of modern day slavery and human trafficking. But I have been uh, making some videos lately on different subject matter. But I did a video on uh, Donald Trump's speech to Liberty University, which is in Virginia. Uh, I mistakenly, um, I think, thought that it was in South Carolina, although I did correct myself in the video. But, yeah, it was in Virginia. And then not only, uh, uh, not even, uh, excuse me, days later, not even a week later, I believe, you then had Richard Spencer, who has been described as some kind of white nationalist, uh, convinced a bunch of white people, suspected racist, because I got to say, if you turn it out to a protest with torches to protest the removal of a traitor uh, like General Lee in Virginia, uh, I, I got to say, you, you know, I got to say you a racist suspect. You you know, I, I might can confirm that you a racist even. So um, I think Otis wanted me to talk about that a little uh a little bit tonight. So, Max, uh, where do you, where do you want to start? Well, like I said earlier, Scotty, uh, I'm kind of an emotional mess these days. You know what I mean? So I'm going to just go ahead and throw it in your hands to, to lead the, the show today and pick whatever you want to go with. Um, and uh, I'll just give you the support on it, man. I know you were talking about that Richard Spencer's thing, and that kind of blew my mind because he's not even a freaking Southerner. <clears throat> and he's out there you know, with a bunch of white supremacists and torches and stuff protesting that I believe that they were tearing down the statues in New Orleans, uh, the racist statue. No, this was in Virginia. This was at a public park in Virginia, which has Uh, a a statue of one of the generals of the Confederate Army. uh, um, What's his name again? Uh, Lee, uh, Robert F. Lee, Robert E. Lee, I'm sorry. Yeah, and yes. that was days after Trump gave a speech in Virginia at the religious, the right-wing religious conservative college called Liberty University, which was founded by Jerry Falwell. Now, so let me just go ahead and, and talk a little bit about that. So the context of my video, what I was doing was comparing and contrasting the speech that Donald Trump gave to the college students and their family members at Liberty University. And I was comparing that and contrasting it with a speech that Barack Obama gave in two, 2015 to a um, audience, a primarily white audience in um, where was that at? Uh, Des Moines, Iowa. And I was just in the title of my video was that that uh, suspected racists are more committed to. And I'm paraphrasing uh, suspected racists are more committed to their cause than the victims are committed to their cause. And so I talked about how Donald's speech gave his codified speech and what codification means to me is where I use generic language to where you can't say um, what I'm talking. You can't really say what I'm talking about. But what you have to look at is Donald Trump's background, especially how he ran his campaign and a right wing audience that he was speaking to. It was a very good speech, in, in my opinion, although people try to say it was full of cliches and, and what have you. But I thought it was a very good speech and where he told those right wing students. Well, I can't say what the students feel. Um, their personal politics are, but we know what Liberty University has stood for. And we know what Donald Trump has stood for. And he told those students not to be afraid to challenge the establishment. And when they're talking about the establishment, they're not talking about uh, what people call racism, uh, white supremacy, institutional racism. No, what he was talking about was, it, it, from what I could interpret his codification to mean, was he was talking about don't, don't be a tr- afraid to challenge members of the establishment political parties like the Republicans or the Democrats, and meaning that you don't have to be politically correct and, and what have you. Hey, if you hate black people, then stand on your beliefs. 
Now, of course, he didn't come out and say stuff like that. But again, you will have to go back and read his speech and you will will know of the codification that he was speaking to. Again, it's the audience and the speaker that that we need to uh, understand what they have put out there in in the past to kind of understand what he was talking about. But then I contrasted that with Barack Obama going to a predominantly white audience in um, Des Moines, Iowa, and telling them that liberal, I'm using his words, and labels, but he said liberal students are being coddled on college campuses, and he suggested that they shouldn't get offended and they shouldn't protest if a person who who deals in white supremacist or racist ideology is invited to speak at that college, that they should just uh, let that person speak, and and that when you're being shielded from these views, that you're being coddled like a baby. And and so um, I just felt like that was a perfect example of Barack Obama not being committed to overthrowing racism, quote unquote, white supremacy, which is institutional racism. And that Donald Trump was telling racist suspects to be committed to their cause. And so that now how do I tie that into abolitionism? Well, obviously, abolitionism is not only a moral issue it is a political issue as well as these laws have been put in place by politicians that make people uh, uh slaves of the system and so you know i was just i was just um trying to say that we need to show more commitment especially as abolitionists and i don't divide abolitionists along any kind of color lines Either you for slavery or you against slavery. It's that simple. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't even care what political party you you subscribe to. Or in, either you for slavery or you against slavery. That that is the line in the sand for me. And that we need to be committed in a way that the enemies of freedom, of true freedom and liberty, are committed to keeping slavery in place. Max, your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are in regards to Donald Trump and his speech about, you know, go ahead and exercise your racism if you want to exercise it. I can't really say much of it on air, man. I just can't. I'll leave it to you to go into the explanations. Well, there's there's not much really to explain. And as I stated in the video, he didn't use any overt racist language. If I was to accuse him of practicing racism, people would ask me, where's my proof? And so that's what I think about the ingenuity of his speech writers to write a speech in such a way that they couldn't be accused of racism. But the racist upon hearing that speech would know exactly the uh, what he's talking about or what he was encouraging them to do. So again, it's coded not, language. Yeah, codified language, and I think a lot of people don't understand what codification really, really means. Codification is code. Okay, that's the root word. Code. What is code? Code means that I use words that obscure, obscure the message. So that a person can't really say what I'm speaking on. So you have to use other identifiers to to figure out what they're speaking about. And so, like I said, not only not even a week later, and you just pointed out Richard Spencer wasn't even invited, isn't even a Southerner. He's not from Virginia. He don't live in Virginia. But I imagine he was on hand for that speech that uh, Donald Trump gave, gave. And so he was going to use that energy generated by Donald Trump, who got a standing ovation from a record-breaking crowd of 50,000 for Liberty University. And he got used that energy to then direct those people to a public park. I think it's in Charlottesville, Virginia, a public park funded by taxpayer money where it has been, I think the city council is trying to have it removed. And the mayor doesn't want it removed. 
And so anyway, these people, white people, suspected racists, Confederate sympathizers, traitors, terrorists, uh, turn, uh, turned out to that park following behind Richard Spencer with, with uh, torches, literally with torches. Mm. My, this was a mob. This was what we might call a lynch mob. And so I'm just saying that victims of this system, and we're talking about people being made slaves uh, as according to the 13th Amendment, that we have to be committed. Like Malcolm X said, that, you know, by any means necessary, as we have repeated the quote, which I don't know where it comes from, Death by a Thousand Paper Cuts, which I think was a, a album name, if I, a rock album name, if I'm not mistaken, but Death by a Thousand Paper Cuts, is that whatever it takes, whatever it takes for us to end slavery, uh, legalize slavery in this country, we have to be just com- as committed, if not more committed, than those who would see it remain in place. And as we've documented on this program for you, that modern day slavery is being expanded as we speak with the tremendous growth of the private prison prison companies and the attorney general of the Department US Department of Justice telling telling people that hey, we want to start prosecuting of the drug war like we did during the days of Reagan, like we did during the days of Clinton, like we did, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, to fill these prisons up at at, at um, historical rates. So that's what we got you know, coming from the attorney general talking about uh, uh, triggering more mandatory minimums. There's two thoughts that I do have about this whole scenario. One, if you've seen the video of this mob which is exactly what it was, of white racist supremacists and racism supporters standing there with blazing uh, torches, you would uh, know right off the bat that there is no way in hell, no way, that a black group could have done that and not have been assaulted by the police. It just would not have happened. We, If two or three of us walk around with guns, they start arresting us, exercising our rights in that way. But to have, I don't know, how many people was it in that crowd, Scotty? It looked like it was a few hundred at least. Now, I'm what, not sure. So, And you said 50,000 50, attended at this record-breaking uh, event? So, yeah, if that were all black people, they would be instantly surrounded by police, and at the first wrong movement, somebody would have been shot, and it would have been a slaughter, just like that. But these white boys can get away with that bull stuff. So, yeah, that's that's like the first thing that came to mind for me. And the second thing was, you know, if I was a suicide bomber, that would be the perfect place for me to be. (laughs) Yeah, get them all in one place, right? Um, All in one, boom, gone. Yeah. But again, you know, I understand that there are some people and victims of racism who think we need these monuments to remind us that Robert E. Lee was a Confederate general who would have uh, enslaved Africans still in chains and what have you but I would say that that you know uh, I don't need a statue to remind me of the history of this country that's what they have history books for that's what they have museums for and that I should not be forced as an American citizen to fund these monuments to slavery you know, it's not just a monument to white supremacy. It's monuments to slavery. That was the cause. That was the so-called, what they call the lost cause, was to keep slavery as a pattern in practice. But see, they are ignorant in the fact that they don't realize that slavery actually was never abolished. And that's the reason why the United States has the world's largest prison population and the number um, one demographic of those prisoners are black people. So slavery wasn't abolished. They actually won, if you ask me. These uh, racist white supremacists literally control our government right now. In New Orleans, they have been taking down several uh, monuments, and they've had to do it at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. And the reason they're doing that is because they don't want these racists to come up and rise up and start 
doing things with, like with police people, snipers on the roofs, my, Max. I saw right with yeah, with snipers on the freaking roof, and that's if our government has to function at two and three o'clock in the morning to remove racist statues and uh, monuments declaring slavery the law of the land and we're afraid to function in the daylight because of what these supremacist white racist delusionalists will do then our government is nothing but a paper tiger right they need to stop coddling these terrorists they really do these are terrorists these are insurrectionists you know, uh, um, this is anti-American. These monuments are anti-American. What could be more anti-American than the Confederate States of America? What could be, an- you know, people want to give flack to Colin Kaepernick for not wanting to to stand for the national anthem or, or salute the slaver's flag. You know, uh, where are these people at that's blackballing Colin Kaepernick and calling out these racists, these slavers, these traitors, these insurrectionists. This is this is the promotion of a rebellion. This is the celebration of a rebellion. And if you call yourself an American, then there's no way you could be supporting these these monuments or these people that uh, uh, worship them. You should be calling them anti-American terrorists on the same order that you call ISIS terrorists. What's the difference? The only army that's ever spilled American blood on American soil. Exactly. And, you know, <clears throat> that kind of leads into the next story, too, that I, I wouldn't mind sharing. Uh, and I wish your Hanan was here because this is right up his alley in regards to the stock values and the movements of the corporate entities involved with the prison industrial complex and that's where they're talking about in Forbes magazine no no less about how prison stocks are soaring now uh, under Trump as Jeff Sessions okays private jails. I didn't say private prisons, I said private jails and uh, there's another story later on I wouldn't mind sharing it's about the baby prisons. I mean they're expanding their reach now into the ways that we have not seen at this level before, including baby prisons. And you heard it right. I'll get into that later. But, Scotty, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start on this one. Or did you want to add some more? No, go ahead and get started. All right. Well, this is from Forbes magazine. Again, like I said, I wish Johanna was here. It says, in the final months of the Obama administration, the Justice Department announced it would end the use of private prisons. In the first month of the Trump administration, the rule was was rescinded. In a memo signed February 21st, but released to the public late Thursday, the new U.S. Attorney General, Jeff Beauregard Sessions, rescinded the order. Sessions decided not to phase out the use of private prisons by the federal government, and that bodes well for prison stocks. In August of 2016, less than an August 18th, to be specific, less than an hour after the news broke, shares of the GO Group Incorporated and Core Civic, formerly known as Correction Corporation of America, imploded, losing between 35 and 25 percent respectively in that first hour. Core Civic Incorporated and GO Group Incorporated are two of the largest for profit prison operators in the country. Since the election, both stocks have surged on renewed hopes that the order would be rescinded. Geo Group hit a new record high and shareholders of both stocks are very happy. The long-term contracts are still in place. Now, on this Forbes article, they have several charts here to show you the growth uh, month by month by month of the Geo Group and the Core Civic organization. And if you look at it, you can see that for the most part, revenue and sales are steadily growing for these stocks because the number of prisoners is steadily growing. And that is the bottom line. They wouldn't be making this money if they weren't getting enough prisoners to fill these facilities and enough money to buy new uh, facilities. So now you got for-profit private jails being formed. And I'd like to think that that model derives from what's going on in Louisiana with the parishes and the sheriffs acting as kings of a little kingdom where they use these 
parish, parish jails as a for-profit industry. Yeah, no doubt. And I stand by my comments about the Obama administration. If, if the Obama administration was so anti-slavery, then he would not have waited to the final few months of his last term to make an announcement that, oh, we're going to stop uh, signing new contracts with these private prisons, even though a week later they renewed two contracts. Okay, so so those are my comments uh, on that. But we're going to look at in the next four years a tremendous expansion of slavery and human trafficking in this country. And I t- I tell you, man, it it is reason enough for another civil war. In my opinion, yeah, that's what we've been saying from day one. <laughs> that's how I close the show every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a reason, or every week, it's a reason for a revolution, so we can finally know peace. Um, it's, it's terrible circumstances we're finding ourselves in, and you know, a lot of people will say, "Well, private prisons are not the majority of the prison, uh, the places where prisoners are held," but private prisons are like a cancer in our system. They just have contaminated everything to the point where our state and federal institutions have duplicated the models that these private prisons have instituted, where, you know, they're literally just using people's bodies as commodities and filling up these cells in order to create economic uh, development programs, providing jobs for people as prison guards and probation officers and policemen and construction workers and food providers and on and on and on. You know, we a couple of weeks ago mentioned uh, how, how, how much it costs based on what the GEO Group's quarterly earning reports were saying, where they had a thousand men is worth $44 million in annual revenue. And that's just for the adults. 44 million per thousand and we have 2.4 million people static number that are staying in those prisons and right now they're focusing a lot on or they're filling up the prisons with a lot of undocumented uh immigrants and those undocumented immigrants under the control of the geo group have actually filed a federal lawsuit that we have talked about before about um um, um, suing the GEO group under federal statutes that are supposed to have abolished slavery. And I have mentioned that, well, it'll be interesting to see how the judge rules in that case and how that case turns out because the 13th Amendment, part of the U.S. Constitution, which they say is the supreme law of the land, authorizes slavery. I hope that they can win the case, but at the end of the day, I think that the supreme law of the land is what's going to prevail. I hope that I'm wrong, but e- but either way, the uh, American people are going to get a, a, a message from the courts on whether slavery still exists or not. Not that I need the courts to tell me that, but you will have an official ruling from the bench. So, so, but let's talk about though, um, like this article about who's going to be filling up the prisons because don't get me wrong if you think it's only going to be undocumented immigrants well you are sadly mistaken and there's an article from the Huffington Post that I'm pulling up right now that talks about guess who sessions war on drugs will target so um let me go ahead and go unless Max you had something else to share from that story no, go ahead and continue, uh, and I'll put the uh, article on New Abolitionist Radio so our listeners can access it and view it themselves. Okay, so guess who Sessions won? Attorney Jeff Sessions made it, Attorney General Jeff Sessions made it official. The federal government will now reboot its war on drugs. The official word came down in the form of memos from Sessions that ordered federal prosecutors to cease and desist on the soft approach former Attorney General Eric Holder took towards prosecuting petty drug offenders. Now prosecutors must demand the harshest sentences, uh, must use the threat to harshly pile on sentences to browbeat drug offenders into copying a plea deal. 
and they must itemize the drugs an offender uses to ensure they are slapped with the man- minimum mandatory sentence. Sessions isn't just talking about cracking down on the use of the hard stuff. He has a near paranoid obsession with pot. He has railed against its use, thinking it's one of the worst drugs, and is convinced it is undermining the nation's morals. So he don't smoke pot, but he, in my opinion, he's a moral cesspool, man. But he goes on to say, Sessions has a long has long chomped at the bit to cop the title as America's number one drug warrior. He took Giddy Light as a federal prosecutor and a U.S. attorney in putting the hammer to drug offenders whenever he could. Sessions would likely scoff at the frank admission by disgrace Nixon White House advisor John Eirelichman in an interview in Harper's in 1994 that the drug war on drugs was about law enforcement was not about law enforcement getting a handle on drug sales and use but another weapon to lock up as many blacks as possible from its inception in the 1970s the war on drugs has been a ruthless relentless and naked war on minorities especially African Americans former President Obama and Holder got that and they made it clear that it was time to rethink how the war was being fought and who its prime casualties have been well I'm going to stop it right there you can read the rest of the article um, because this person is probably not aware or their fanaticism and their, um, uh, how should I say this, their nostalgia. Insanity. For, what's that, Max? Insanity. Or nostalgia for this President Obama administration that did not exist. Okay, again, if he was against slavery and the use of private prisons, he wouldn't have waited till the last few months of his administration to announce that we weren't going to renew any contracts and then turn around and renew a contract a week later. So y'all want to hold up Sally Yates as some kind of hero because she testifying to, to Congress about Donald Trump and some freaking Russians. You know, well, she gave that press conference in the next week. They renewed the contract with a private prison slaver. Eric Holder, while he was there, uh, when when the Congress and Obama signed the uh, reduction in the crack cocaine disparity, again, if you were really committed, it wouldn't be no sus- disparity. And if you're really, really, really committed, uh, you would uh, uh, eliminate the Drug Enforcement Agency and get the federal government out of drug prohibition, period. But they passed that law that uh, changed it from 100 to 1, to 18 to 1 then all those people who have been in prison probably since uh, um, uh, Hillary Clinton was out there on the campaign trail for her husband trying to pass the uh, Biden written uh, what what do they call it the new, the, I, I forget the exact name of the legislation the omnibus bill? yeah the omnibus bill and, and flooding the streets with slave catchers and she was out there telling them that hey black and brown kids are super predators and we must bring them to hell. Some of these people been locked up since then and instead of allowing these people to get out now that the sentencing has been changed, no. Eric Hall argued in court that oh we don't want to make this retroactive we want to keep them in jail. No, this is for new slaves. This ain't for the ones we already caught. So again, this is this is the problem with reporters or journalists not being objective and being partisan. Okay, I I, I have I have no reason to 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 demonize the Obama administration. I'm just simply going to let the facts speak for themselves. And so this whole thing about it being softer and all this, another reason why they didn't want to prosecute people for petty drug crimes is because it keeps contributing to the national debt. How much are they making for locking up somebody in jail or eventually in prison on some 
on some nonviolent victimless crime related to cannabis. So he kind of lost me there when he started making it seem like the Obama administration was soft on the drug war. No, more p- people kept getting locked up, okay? He, they kept getting, just because he commuted the sentences of a few hundred people, um, there were th- about a thousand that was being locked up over under those same laws. So I just want to point that out. But we have, I just want y'all to know that they not just targeting these undocumented immigrants and, and filling the prisons up with them. They coming back after us as well. Max. Um, you're absolutely right. And we can see these processes being repeated of what happened in 1994 where they demonized black people. Well, now they're demonizing immigrants. And we've heard, and I just put up the post where you could hear it in your own words if you're a listener, Jan Mickelson of uh, Ohio, a a very popular radio talk show host who was openly calling for the enslavement of immigrants, saying that, you know, if they're not, if they don't leave the country in 90 days, they become the property of the United States of America, and we get to create jobs for them to do free. Didn't he say what's wrong with slavery? He was literally calling it slavery. Max, didn't he say? Didn't he say what's wrong with slavery? What What's the problem with slavery? Because one of the callers called in and said, "You know what? It's a it's a clever idea, but it sounds a lot like slavery, and I don't think people would put up with it. There would be this big backlash." And this expletive said, "What's wrong with slavery?" And this is the very same man who has interviewed and spoke with every Republican presidential candidate that was on the ballot. And not a single one of them had anything bad to say about his suggestion. As a matter of fact, he even uh, pointed out that we should use these immigrants to build Trump's walls, as well as prison slave labor. And then we saw uh, immediately after that states like Colorado and Massachusetts where this, this, the uh, sheriffs came out and said, hey, you can use our prisoners to build your wall. Oh, man, it's just terrible, Scotty. It just is freaking terrible. But we're fighting. We're here, and we've been winning some some battles, and we know that this beast can die. We saw that August 18th of 2016, when those stocks almost went to the floor and uh, we cut deeply. Now, they recovered from that head wound, came back stronger than ever, but we know they can bleed now. Uh, speaking of also sessions, a comrade, Jeff Humphill, is on the line right now, and he said he has a story that he would like to share in regards to the Jeff Sessions narrative. Yeah, if he would like to unmute himself uh, by hitting star star. Because I'm not, I don't know his phone number. Uh, it's probably this Kansas City number right here. There you go. Uh, caller, you're on the air. New Abolitionist Radio. This is it Jeff? Uh, they seem to have, okay, here we go. 919, oh, Max. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Yeah, just hit star star if you would like to share. Uh, again, we can pretty much in free flow. Got too many stories to share, uh, but we love to hear from, uh, reports from the field. So eight one six, it seems you unmuted yourself. Go ahead with your question or comment. Thank Hello. you for sharing. Hey Jeff. Yeah, this this is Jeff in Kansas City. All can right, you hear Jeff. Me? Yep, we can yeah. hear you. Welcome uh, to New Abolitionist Radio, brother. Well, it's good to hear listen to you guys tonight. Um, we had a on Jaws of Justice. We had a we play the 420 Drug War News, which is out of uh, Houston. Um, Dean Becker's show. He he takes little pieces of his show Century of Lies, which is about the uh, drug war on people. Um, and he had a story that was just unbelievable. Uh, Georgia evidently has started a new program where they're training their officers, and I, I take this to be the, um, I don't know whether it's just the, the, the police in, in regular towns or whether this is the, the state police, um, how to identify drivers who are under the influence of cannabis, being there is no, no test that they can give them right there on the street. 
and they are arresting people um, on these on this stuff. And when they get into court, and these people have to go to court, and they have to hire lawyers and everything else, and present their uh, um, negative drug tests. The police say that doesn't make any difference. Um, those drug tests can be be faked. Those drug tests aren't always um, correct, but our methods always work. So what you're looking at is um, them just being able to decide who they want to arrest and when they want to arrest them and um, who they want to enslave, basically. They, they get to pick and choose, and we know who they're going to pick more often than not. My God, man. I, get, I already told you, today I'm just a little emotional wreck. Just hearing stuff like this just drives me nuts because that is the case. They they go into the minority communities and they stalk the people, they hunt the people, they park their cars, and they scan the license plates. And they don't do that in the more upscale communities. You don't see them doing that out in places where, like Wall Street area or, you know, maybe out in uh, Carmel, California, where the money's at. That doesn't happen there. Although we know that they'll find just as many drugs, just as many crimes, just as many everything else there. So when you hear news like this where now they don't even have to verify whether or not you have had marijuana in your system, they just say it's so, and according to their records, it's so. Well, that's pretty. That's that's a pretty bold position to take publicly, and it just reminds me that when Jeff Sessions was at that convention, I guess, of U.S. attorneys from the different states. You know, each state has an attorney general or the top cop in the state. And when he, at that conference, said that we're not going to investigate these police, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he basically said, we're not going to investigate these police over complaints of constitutional violations. We're not going to tell them how to do their jobs. To me, that was signaling what we're seeing. Okay, that was signaling to the law enforcement on every level that, hey, it's free reign out here. You, Hey, you make the rules, and we're not here to interfere with it. So um, that that's just sad. Yes. Well, guys, I'm, um, I'm going to move on and listen to the show, but I just I had to bring that story up because you were talking about mm-hmm. Mr. Sessions, or if you want to call him that, I, I have a different title for him. Um, we have something and, coming up in the future as well, right, Jeff? Um, yeah. Well, we we did the show on on the million um, millions for prisoners march in Washington for prisoners' human rights on Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, we we got all sorts of stuff coming up. <laughs> Indeed, man. Pay attention to Jaws of Justice Radio. Uh, they they stay on point. Um, there are comrades in arms and uh, out here disseminating the information and sharing it as much as possible, especially out there where you're at, where now children can receive felonies for schoolyard fights and uh, face a life of uh, criminalization, you know, at seven years old. <laughs> they can be arrested and charged with a felony for a schoolyard fight out there in Missouri. Yeah, I, it's no other way to describe it other than slavery. Thanks again, Jeff. We appreciate you, brother. Did you have another comment, Jeff? Okay. I think he muted himself. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I, I oh. actually did have, have one. Um, Max asked what we had coming up, and actually next Monday we are going to be talking about a, a Justice Department report that came out, of course, before Mr. Sessions, about um, deaths in jails and how people are dying and uh, I think that's that's going to be a real important one. What, what, what can they hear your and, program? Um, we are on 90.1 FM in Kansas City, but you can get us on kkfi.org. Um, that's the radio station here in Kansas City. We're a community station. And we're on at um, from 9 to 10 on Monday mornings, and that's Central Daylight Time. All right. Well, I certainly will try to tune in. Do y'all have a podcast for those that that can't make the live yeah. show? All right, great, great, great. Um, I usually put podcasts up just with 
within you know within an hour after the show. Okay. All right. So. Well, that's something for us to tune in to. Thanks, Jeff. Thank All you, right. brother. You guys have a good evening. You too. For our listeners, that link is provided on New Abolitionist Radio, so you can check them out right there. Let, let uh, me say something. Link, take right to it. To what he just mentioned about this uh, the DOJ report uh, coming out on prisoners' deaths in custody. Now, I was seeing a headline from the corporate media talking about in Syria they they have this prison and they're creating a crematorium to put these political prisoners to death and and I'm like do you know how many people die in prisons and jails in the United States but you want me not not that I don't I'm not concerned about life all over the planet and also not that I believe that coming from the corporate media um, I, I need to see more evidence than than somebody saying, well, it, it looks like a crematorium. See this this uh, 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 smokestack here or, or whatever. Uh, but I'm like, man, just in the state of Florida where so many people were dying in prison, they had to create a website just for the number of prisoners they get killed or died due to medical neglect or in Daryl Rainey's case where he was boiled to death yeah, so again, that's why I I do not like the corporate media. They want us to take issue. Again, I not saying we shouldn't care about what happens to people across the planet because slavery is global. But we are right here in the United States and we have abuses that's going on that quite frankly the corporate media doesn't do justice to. If they spend half the time uh, speaking about the problems of modern day slavery and human trafficking in the United States as they focus on Russians, you know, allegedly interfering in elections and all that garbage, you know, more people would be enlightened to what's going on where they live. So, yeah, appreciate that. One of the things that this is going to lead to with this uh, push for interaction with communities of color uh, with the police is deaths. Just this past week or 10 days, I have seen five or six different stories of 15-year-old boys either dying at the hands of police, being shot to death, or uh, dying in adult prison. Uh, just just this past few weeks alone, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, cops shot a, ha- a boy handcuffed him and left him laying in the street for hours as he bled to death. Um, in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in New Orleans, a 15-year-old boy was placed into an adult prison where he was brutalized and then finally ended up committing suicide using the ace bandage that had been wrapped around his uh, much damaged arm. Uh, then there's another one where the uh, video just came out uh, about a 15-year-old boy in Texas that was shot. Uh, that I mean, I think we talked about it last week, where he was driving away from a party after the police showed up, and the policeman used a rifle, shot him in the back, right in his head, in front of his family members. He was no threat whatsoever. The car was no threat. He just, and the police decided he was going to get him a rifle and shoot at this moving car with children and killed him. So uh, that's just a few of them. I'll, I'll put them up on New Abolitionist Radio. But that's where we're going to see a lot of. We're going to see a lot of dead children, dead innocent people, as more and more interactions occur between police and an already distrustful population. Speaking of children, man, those are the couple of sh- stories I wanted to share, but we're like about three minutes away from our, our first break. So I'll get on them after the break. Uh, we got two about stories six minutes, about... Max. Yes? We we have about six minutes. All right. Well, I'll do, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go through the the first one then. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a video provided for it, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Um, this one comes out of W. FTV9 ABC and it says Acala, Florida, nine investigates learned adoption attorneys are paying for food clothing and other items for inmates serving sentences right in central Florida in anticipation of being able to adopt out those inmates babies though 
Some describe it as buying a baby. It's legal. And one particular attorney has been supporting both pregnant inmates and others financially for years. Inside Lowell Corrections Institution, north of Wakala, thousands of Florida women are serving out sentences. Among them is a population often forgotten, unborn babies with uncertain futures. I don't know what I was going to do with my child, a former inmate told investigative reporter Carla Bray. I was safe. I knew I was go- where I was going to go, but I didn't know what I was going to do, and it was scary. The former inmate who went on the record with nine investigates agreed to do so under the condition of anonymity because some of her own family members don't know she gave up a baby for adoption while serving a grand theft sentence inside the woman's prison. I just want him to know I did it so he could have a better life. I didn't want him to suffer from my mistakes, the former inmate said. I was in a rough part of my life, and I did what was best for him at the time. I'll always love him. Nine investigates learned through speaking from several former inmates and employees that choice is often met with large financial incentives by private adoption attorneys. The woman who spoke on the record with us received $5,000 which was split into a prison commissary account and a lump sum given to a family member outside of prison. Collaray asked, for some people, can you see them making this decision because of that? Definitely, yeah. Because when you're in prison and you have nothing and all these people have stuff, it's hard, it's hard to sit with nothing, the former inmate said. You can read the rest of this story on New Abolitionist Radio. But uh, apparently... Adoption agencies are working directly with the prison companies in order to get these unborn children from these women that they are arresting uh, at birth. And it's a for-profit industry. It's a damn shame. It's like I just, oh, crimes against humanity on top of crimes against humanity. You criminalize these women. You put them in positions where poverty is the only choice they got and they got to learn to live with it or go to prison and then when they go to prison pregnant you got a bunch of people sitting on the outside paying independent private companies to get their children reminds me of the uh, the Catholic schools a uh, long time ago and what they used to do with the Native American children the same exact thing it is sick still do as a matter of fact yeah you know, uh, mentioning uh, children um, before we get ready to go to break. Uh, right now, there is a bill being debated on the North Carolina House floor in the legislature uh, to to raise the age of uh, where you can be charged as an adult. Um, right in North Carolina, I think as young as 14 years old, uh, if not 16 but you can be charged as an adult, even though the science, this isn't Scotty saying this, but scientists have de- determined that biologically a uh, human being's brain isn't fully developed until they turn about 26 years old. And, and, and yet, you know, you want to charge children as an adult's, as if they have full awareness of of whatever it is that they're doing, if, in fact, they are guilty of doing anything. So when you mention the children, I just wanted to recognize that that has been debated. I've been tweeting, uh, sending a couple of tweets out and signing petitions uh, to the North Carolina legislature to raise the age. Indeed, Scotty. Just one last quote, and then we'll go to break. It says, it is illegal to sell a minor. But under Florida law, adoptees or adoption entities can pay for expectant mother's prenatal care, living expenses, or medical expenses for up to six weeks after the baby is born. For inmates, much of that is already covered by your your tax dollars. But extra food, water, clothing, and hygiene items can be purchased by inmates through the prison's canteen. Babies for sale. You're listening to New Abolitionist Radio. We're talking about modern day slavery and human trafficking. We're going to take a couple of messages from our sponsors and we'll be right back after this.
Black Talk Radio Network is made possible in part with help from the Black Talk Media Project, a North Carolina-based nonprofit engaged in the production and distribution of independent digital black media. Find out more by going to blacktalkradionetwork.com or blacktalkmediaproject.org and look for the menu tab, Crowdfunding Black Media. Black Talk Media Project, helping to provide you with new black media for the new millennium. Tuned in to Black Talk Radio, new black media for the new millennium. Welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. They're going on in Florida, where as many as 370 women have sold their children from inside a prison in Florida in the past five years and been compensated for it financially. Uh, for the sale of their children. Now, we're going to go on to the next one-two of this one-two punch. Max, before uh, you do so, before you do so, if I might add that, you know, this past Sunday was Mother's Day, and I was surrounded by beautiful mothers, my own mother, my sister who's a mother, and to uh, my daughters who are, are mothers. And you know, it just reminded me, and I'm sorry if I can't give the statistics straight off the top of my head. I just can't remember them right now. But I think over 50% of women who are in state prisons are mothers. A lot of moms are in prison. And I have said something about it in the past about feminists and women's rights advocates how come y'all don't never talk about the fact that women are the fastest growing demographic of new slaves on the prison plantation since the 1980s they have become the fastest growing demographic and of those out of that demographic the number one sub demographic is black women but again far too many mothers are in prison and you know we, quite frankly we need all hands on deck but I would like to see more of these women advocacy groups start picking up the mantle of abolitionism because it's affecting men, women more than we know and their children indeed. and their children indeed like you I'm surrounded by beautiful strong women my wife is sitting right behind me right now and I've got three daughters uh, and I've got uh, how many of my granddaughters are girls? Nine? Nine of the 15 of my grandchildren are girls. I'm surrounded by beautiful women. And uh, as I mentioned earlier today, I got to see the face of my oldest grandchild just today, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm kind of a mess. You know what I mean? And I want to give a shout out to this group who just organized uh, 25 groups across the country, organized National Mama's Bailout Day, and went around bailing out mothers from prison for Mother's Day. Shout out to y'all for doing that. That is just beautiful. Just beautiful. Well, there you have it. So the next part of our one-two punch about what's going on moves us to Texas. And in Texas, this comes from the Texas Observer, the Texas Senate passed a bill just this past Tuesday that would license immigrant family detention centers, which critics call baby jails as child care facilities. Wow. I can't even... It just... The, uh, my mouth to say that a prison is running a child care facility. Then, which would allow prisons, firms, to skip all the burdensome regulations that other child care facilities must follow. The bill was written by Geo Group Incorporated. Uh, come on now. You got prisons writing our damn laws. 
The bill was written by Geo Group Incorporated, the nation's second largest for prison, for-profit prison corporation. It advanced on a 20 to 11 party line vote with all Senate, and Senate Republicans in favor, every damn one of them. The very idea of holding children in a baby jail is unconscionable in my book. They're not leaving their country to come here for fun, says Senator Sylvia Garcia, Democrat from Houston. This is a vendor bill, if I've ever seen one. SB 1018 provides the Department of Family and Protective Services, which is anything but, with broad authority to waive any minimum standards it deems necessary in order to license the facilities. So they, they can do whatever they want. The centers are used by the federal government to hold mothers and children seeking asylum, often after fleeing violence in Central America. Due to federal court's rulings, family detention centers can currently hold children for a few weeks at a time, but the bill will allow the facilities to detain mothers and children for the duration of their asylum cases. Two of the nation's three family detention centers uh, facilities are in Texas, and both are run by private prison corporations. Together, they hold about 3,200 detainees. Uh, and if you remember correctly, for every thousand, that's 44 million. So you're talking about 4812, $130 million a year in revenue. The bill is placing a lot of faith in the ability of the state to protect these children. But the bottom line is these are prisons, and there's no question about that says Senator Jose Rodriguez, Democratic, from El Paso. There may be some TVs here and there, some bunk beds, but it is a secure facility, a baby jail. Rodriguez also said SP 1018 would lead to lesser standards and lack of accountability that will result in women and children being harmed. The Texas Pediatric Society has said the facilities cause depression and anxiety and can impede development in children. Uh, there's more to this story. You kind of get the gist of what's going on right now. They, uh, because of the Trump administration, have been allowed to go past any regulations that are set into place to make sure that children are cared for properly and to forego all of that and just go ahead and get their licenses as baby jails so they can start holding children for profit. And the worst part of it all, and it's always the worst part of it all, is a damn prison company, a for profit prison company wrote the laws that were just passed by our own legislature. Scotty? Man, I, I just don't know what to say, man, but you said it when you said talked about um, the GEO group writing this bill, which is not surprising to us because we talked about ALEC in the past and they have these legislative conferences where they bring in state legislatures and uh, give them classes on how to pass this legislation that they've come up with and sell it to the public. There's something just terribly, terribly wrong with that. And again, I question people's priorities we're so consumed with look I'm not saying that we're not supposed to be paying attention to Donald Trump but the stuff that they be bringing up is just ridiculous and I think it serves the purpose of being a distraction I can't turn on CNN and and I don't obviously don't watch it on a regular basis but when I'm passing through I will change the channel to, to CNN see what they talking about 24-7 Trump you would think that the Republican primary was still going on. You getting so much Donald Trump this, Donald Trump that. And most of it is not of anything of substance. But you got the GEO Group, a private prison company, a private prison slaver, writing bills and getting it passed. But I don't hear Rachel Maddow ranting about that. I don't see Trevor Noah cracking jokes about it on The Daily Show. I don't see... Uh, what was his name uh, from South Carolina? Stephen Colbert raising these issues. I'm just, man, I'm just so fed up with corporate media. Maybe that's why I started a nonprofit uh, new media organization and been podcasting since 2007. But I'm just, man, it, it makes me mad because I have daughters, I have children, grandchildren now. 
and I'm concerned about all children across this nation. So, um, you know, it's just very troubling. I would ask people, especially people on the Black Talk Radio Network, to stop. If you're doing a political radio program, stop with the distractions, okay? I, I'm just so sick of hearing about what Donald Trump had for breakfast or Donald Trump did this or Donald Trump did that. If you ain't talking about Donald Trump as it relates to modern day slavery and human trafficking and what's happening to our people and all you talking about is some Russians and some uh, he's unqualified and, and you know he's number 45 and all. I'm just so tired of hearing about it because you're, you, you're wasting valuable air time and in not informing people about uh, modern day slavery and human trafficking. Again if, if I'm not saying that we don't need other type of programming most certainly we need other type of programming but if you call yourself a political talk show i would ask that you focus on the biggest issue facing us in this 21st century which is human trafficking and slavery legalized slavery let's uh um i thought we had um had a call uh but they seem to have muted themselves uh again but max uh did you want to continue or do we want to move to uh, another story? Yeah, go ahead and pick the next story you'd like to cover. At some point, I would also like to mention the interview that I just recently did with the Real News Network in regards to the Convention of States. To, if we had uh, a video, we can uh, take a listen to it if we got the video, Max. Oh, uh, yeah. The the video is available. I think I put it on the in New Abolitionist Radio. It's right there at the top in our planning. Okay, uh, I will there. find it. But uh, before yep. before we yeah, move to also that, on New Abolitionist Radio, okay. Before we move um, to listening to Max on with Eddie Conway on the Real News Network, um, I just want to bring up what's his name, uh, David Clark. Okay, D- Sheriff David Clark. Yeah, cover that. Yeah, Sh- David Clark. This county, Milwaukee County, is rated number one in the country for targeting black males, okay? Targeting black males. There were four deaths, including a baby, since we're talking about babies, including a baby where a pregnant woman was in his jail begging for medical attention and she went into labor. They ignored her. She ended up having the baby on the jail floor and the baby ended up dying. To me, that is manslaughter by medical neglect willful metal i would even go as high as i would you know if i want to act like jeff session and slap him with the most serious charges i would say second degree murder all right then now there his jail is on several deputies i believe have been indicted for the murder of a man by the name of mr thomas i can't remember his first name for withholding water from this man for seven days uh, by his family, they say that he was suffering from mental illness. Apparently, he had clogged up the toilet in his jail cell, flooding the floor. To show, to teach him a lesson, they deprived him of water for seven days, for which he died. That's just two other deaths. There were two other ones that I don't know the details of right now. So, so as his department or his yeah, his department, deputies in his department are being prosecuted or have been indicted for this. This man is getting a promotion to the Trump administration and Homeland Security. Now, it seems like he's just going to be an errand boy, you know. Uh, the, the, the way it's being described is he's supposed to be a li- liaison for for the homeland security and other police departments all around the country you know that kind of is kind of scary but you know that just goes to show you if we're going to talk about donald trump let's talk about something serious concerning donald trump and that's going to impact us this is a slaver who has called people scum that need to be eradicated off the face of the planet who has told people If American citizens under the banner of Black Lives Matter come to your town to protest, that you better push them out your town. This is one of the most anti-American, anti-black 
public officials that I have ever had the sorry pleasure or, or the sorry occasion to read about. And he's being promoted to Homeland Security. The coward is going to leave his deputies to deal with the mess of a jail that, that, he, that he has overseen for at least the past four years, if I'm not mistaken, while he bails out and goes to the Trump administration. And that just really, again, if you want to talk about Donald Trump not being qualified, well, it depends on what his goals are. And we know he appointed Jeff Session and that the goal was to expand the private prison market, which he successfully did. And we just talked about filling up the prisons. And so, you know, now they need a, a liaison with all these other slave catchers across the nation uh, 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 whom Donald Trump is saying being unfairly demonized and, and all of that. Look, we just report the stories. The facts speak for themselves. They don't need me to demonize them. They're doing a good job of it themselves. They may not see themselves as demons, but I certainly do. So I just wanted to point out that one of the most anti-black uh, pro-slavery anti-American sheriffs is being promoted to homeland security within the Trump administration that's all I wanted to say about that Max and you know the statistics about his area Milwaukee County is just so outrageous um, according to what we have reported earlier here on New Abolitionist Radio more than one out of two black men in Milwaukee County are expected to serve time in prison before they're 30 years old. More than one in two. The national average is one out of 100 people are incarcerated in our, in our country. But in Milwaukee County, it's one out of two. More than one out of two. And that's where he's at. And now mind you, as you pointed out, this is a black man. And if there was a living, breathing example of Stephen from Django, he would be it. Uh, probably, uh, I would say that this is person, Sheriff David Clark, who we have had the misfortune of actually interacting with and communicating with, is a person who I detest more than anyone else on this planet. Oh, he won't engage me anymore, Max. But no, I did not point out his skin color uh, because his skin color ain't important if you catch my meaning, okay? Yes. So, I know. I didn't say say that. I said he's anti-American and anti-black and pro-slavery. That's all you need to know about this, man. His skin color don't matter because we get blinded sometimes by skin color. And... We allow that, it, just talking about Barack Obama's administration, which I failed to mention if he was so against the drug war, why didn't he remove cannabis from the Schedule One list of most dangerous drugs, which it is not, even though he said cannabis is no more dangerous than, than alcohol. So we tend to get blinded, and people, period, tend to get blinded by skin color and not looking at, the substance of the person's character and, and I'm just trying to become more codified and, and, and just make it about slavery which is race based but make no mistake if you are in the wrong zip code or you don't belong to the same economic social uh, 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 bracket oh they got white slaves in there too so uh, abolitionism is not a matter of skin color. It's a matter of slavery and human trafficking. And whether you're for it or against it, it's no fence riders. We ain't allowing that. No reform in slavery. We got to end it. I know, right? Imagine people running around talking about, you know what? We need to reform murder. <laughs> we need to reform rape. We need to reform genocide. You don't hear that. But you certainly hear we need to reform slavery all day, every day. Most certainly. Max, I'm trying to find your... Um... It's on New Abolitionist Radio as okay. well. Can you, right Can you set it up for us? Can you set it up for us? Conservatives are getting closer to the first constitutional convention since 1787. So while you look for that, I do want to make an apology. Uh, 
first let me state when I found out about this movement some months ago, I couldn't find anybody else that was aware of it within the activist community. So I went and did some research, uh, and I, you know, I dug deeply and tried to learn as much as I possibly can. But I'm no expert on any of this, and I'm certainly not a constitutional attorney. But I became aware of it, and I did my best to make others aware of it. And Eddie Conway, uh, I brought it to his attention, and it intrigued him as well because this is very serious. Uh, for more than a few reasons. And along the way, I may have said, you know, I, sometimes I might have said in the interview, constitutional convention, when in fact what they are moving towards is a convention of states. It's a very similar thing where, you know, legislators are allowed to change our constitution and add amendments, but there's different ways of going about it. So what we're talking about is a convention of states. Max, that video of you and Eddie Conway, I, I do not see it on New Abolitionist Radio. I'm actually trying to scroll down my timeline because I remember posting it. So, um, but so it's explain the, the difference to me. New What's this? Yeah, I look for it. What's the difference between a uh, constitutional convention and a convention of states? Uh, a convention of states and a constitutional convention, uh, if you're asking me to give you the breakdown just give me a second i actually wrote it down a constitutional convention is a gathering for the purpose of writing a new constitution or revising an existing constitution members of a constitutional convention sometimes referred to as delegates to a constitutional convention are often elected by popular vote so that's what a constitutional convention is a convention of states is where the states uh representatives gather to approve uh participation in a convention of states where very much the same things can occur as in a constitutional convention. Now, is it the last thing you posted? Cause that doesn't look like it is the third in line on new abolitionist radios, Facebook page. It's right under the Koch bankrolls move to rewrite the constitution, uh, which is another aspect of what's going on. This is a Koch. Uh, Co- okay. Koch I, brothers, or the Koch brothers. Let me see. Yeah. I think I see it now. It's on. Um, it's in the videos on in BTR community. Yeah, here it go. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, here it is. Let's go ahead and give it a listen. Well, a couple of minutes of it. I think it's fifteen minutes long. So it's a couple of minutes. I'm Eddie Conway, coming to you from Baltimore. Welcome to the Real News. Uh, Recently, after the election of uh, Trump and his administration, there's been a renewed effort to open up the Constitution for changes. And Article 5 in the uh, Constitution allows for X amount of states to uh, decide or even a certain number of people in the Congress to decide that they want to amend the Constitution. Uh, what's important about this time is that it seems like it's the most serious effort to uh, open the Constitution and change some of the laws that protects us and affects us. So I have with me today uh, Max Pothis uh, from New Abolitionist uh, Radio who has been looking at this and he's going to try to explain some of it to us and so we can get an understanding of just how serious this might be. Uh, Max? Yes, sir. Uh, Hello again, Brother Eddie. It's good to be here with you. Okay. Uh, Could you talk to us about this movement afoot uh, with this new uh, Constitution Convention effort? Yes. uh, Well, let me put... Like you said, this is a very serious circumstance. It's the first in the history of our nation since 1787, I believe, was the last constitutional convention. It's a back door into the Constitution in order to go into it and be able to change amendments, add amendments, and so on and so forth. There is, of course, a process involved, and that process is ongoing right now as we speak, and it has uh, really gained a lot of momentum. Of the 34 states required in order to get, uh, get a constitutional convention, we have already seen 10 sign on. Two within the last 60 days or so uh, have signed on. I have a full list of all the 10 states. Uh, the 
movement itself is sponsored by some very high profile industries like the American uh, Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC, as well as there's involvement with the Koch brothers and George Soros, who are both vying to gain control of this. Now, this constitutional convention is like a, a separate thing altogether. Several organizations and groups are vying to take control of it and to manipulate it and put in what they want to put in. From what I understand, at least one group has about 11 amendments that are already listed that they wish to propose to the Constitution, and that's from the Adam Lev the Mark Levin group. And then there's another group uh, which has four amendments that they're looking to propose. It seems to me that Alex, uh, Alex, the, that group right there, doesn't care which group wins as long as there is a constitutional convention. It seems to me like that is their main goal so that they can take whatever weight and money they have to be able to come in and then take control at that time. Let me tell you what a constitutional convention is. <clears throat> it's a gathering for the purpose of writing a new constitution or revising an existing constitution members of a constitutional convention, sometimes referred to as delegates to a constitutional convention, are elected by popular vote. Um, and as I said, the last time we saw this was in 1787. Uh, if you have any questions, I can answer. If not, more that I could tell you about it and why I'm so concerned and why everybody else should be concerned too. Well, yeah, I do. Uh, I'm curious because I was kind of looking at it. I mean, you know, it came across uh, the radar with me a month or two ago. And then I, I, I thought back about it and I realized that the uh, Black Panther Party had actually proposed a constitution convention back in uh, uh, seven, uh, 1976. Uh, and uh that was an effort to go in and rewrite some of the Constitution so that it would be uh, in favor of people down on the ground, poor people, black people, uh, uh, other other minorities and people that has been suffering oppression in America. And so I said, well, OK, that was an effort that we had put forth. But. Then I look at this effort, and it seems to be coming from the Tea Party, the extreme right, and it seems to be in the interest of dismantling the government. Uh, you said there's 10 states already signed on to it. What, yes. what are their issues? What do they want? Um, as I said, the two groups who are primary leading this have a list of things that they're looking for. The Mark Levin group. Uh, has 11 amendments. Uh, I'll give you one or two of them. For example, top of their uh, list is term limits. He proposes limiting service in both the House and the Senate to 12 years. And uh, they said they've heard all the arguments about elections being the best limit, but the last 100 years has proven that to be false. As someone who works day and night to throw the bums out, I can tell you that it's nearly impossible to throw them out, uh, throw, throw them out with the money uh, amount of money they raised precisely for their abuses of power. Levin also proves that limiting time in office has a highly regarded proposal during their Constitution of co Congress. This is their own writing on their website. Uh, and one other one I'll just read. I won't read the description too much of it, but let's say number six, defining the Commerce Clause. Levin writes an amendment that, while technically unnecessary, is practically an imperative re to restoring the original intent of the Commerce Clause. So they're going into some things that like, we're not even very much aware of. Commerce clauses, repealing the 17th Amendment, restoring judiciary to its proper role, limiting taxation and spending. But in none of these documents or none of these proposals does an amendment to the 13th Amendment exist. And, you know, that's our main goal is to remove the exception clause from the 13th Amendment. So this is a possibility for us to work with people who we normally wouldn't work with to get something like that done if we can get a seat at the table. But if we don't get a seat at the table, then I suspect that we'll have a bunch of racists, right wingers, uh, Republican Party members backed by uh, m big money from Alec and many other international corporations who will take over our Constitution and write it as they want it to be seen well, without us. All right, Mace, we'll see. Yeah, stop that's enough there. right there. 
Yeah, it's some different. It's some. It's a lot to talk about there that we can. I do want to talk about on the other side of the break. Yes, sir. You're listening to New Abolitionist Radio here with Max Parthas and Scotty Reed. We'll be right back after these messages. Black Talk Radio Network. For podcasts and live program scheduling, visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. Welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. Uh, we just heard the interview, or part of it, that I had with Eddie Conway on the Real News Network. Shout out to Eddie. Uh, he has been really uh, digging deeply into this information as well as other uh, inf- pieces of information regarding modern day slavery and human trafficking through his series called Rattling the Bars. And you know, I mentioned, Scotty, that at that time, just last week, there were 10 states. Well, Missouri just became the 12th state to adopt a convention of states just in this short period of time. See? They only need 34. See? And I also came across an article where I, I think I put this out in a video, but I mentioned that if you if they count states that have already signed on for this back 20 years ago it could already be over 30 something states if though if yes. they include those but just for this particular segment that we're talking about yeah I saw where you posted today the 12th state who has so it's going to happen the republicans conservatives whatever label you want to slap on them are in control of enough state legislatures, more than 34, I would imagine, to make it happen. So where where do we want to be? Standing on the outside of the convention with a protest sign in my hand? No, I do not. I want to see it at the table. You know why? Because I'm an American citizen. I have a right right to have a seat at that table. All right? And don't get me to start, you know, uh, uh, displaying my U.S. nationalism because I can talk just like they talk. And I think my American credentials are probably better than theirs. So if we think that this is not going to happen because I have seen some Democrats uh, already trying to put the bug in our ear not to participate. We need to protest this. We need to stop this. But what are you doing? to change the 13th Amendment. I don't have a problem with with them uh, implementing, uh, what do they call it, um, um, term limits. I've heard of term limits going back, you know, 20 years people been talking about that. And I, I do support term limits because, like you mentioned, that's why you can't, it's so hard to get these crooks out of there. They get entrenched in Washington, D.C., living off the government tit, all right, and doing things that are not in the best interest of the people, but in the best interest of their bank accounts, in the best interest of their uh, comfort and what have you. Because a lot of times when many of them leave public service, they go right to working for these corporations that have been giving as much money as possible to their campaigns and setting up super PACs to get them reelected. So why would anybody have a problem with term limits? Unless you a politician that's been in there 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, and you know, you you just love that, that position. No, let some new people with new ideals, let some young people get in there and do the job. All right? So that's how they keep the old guard in place. So I have nothing against a constitutional convention if we can get a seat at the table. And I I believe, Max, we should contact those groups, the one you talked about that has 11 amendments. And we need to be lobbying hard to get a seat at the table and the 13th Amendment on the table. Yes, sir. I, I have actually reached out to those groups, and I'm hoping to be able to contact them. I feel some kind of way because I know who I'm dealing with. I've heard their rhetoric. I've listened to them talk. And I know that these people harbor racist mentalities. 
But again, this is our nation, not just their nation. And we should have an opportunity to present our own amendments or our own changes to the Constitution <clears throat> that we'd like to see to put into place. For instance, removing the exception clause from the 13th Amendment. We're in agreement with these groups on many of the issues that they're addressing. But unfortunately, because <clears throat> the things that we are concerned with is of no concern to them, they are not being presented. And that's where we need to get in on this so we can get our goals presented as well. And, you know, I apologized earlier because I was saying convention of uh, Constitution of Convention versus Convention of State. And I just want to read <clears throat> what a Convention of States is versus what I read earlier, the uh, Constitutional Convention. And Article 5 of the United States Constitution describes the process whereby the Constitution, <clears throat> the nation's frame of government, may be altered. Altering the Constitution consists of proposing an amendment or amendments and subsequent ratification. Amendments may be proposed either by Congress with a two-thirds vote in both the House of Representatives and the Senate or by a convention of states called for by two-thirds of the state legislators. So in 12 states, two-thirds of the state legislators have called for a convention of states, an Article 5 convention of states, and this is happening rapidly. I've heard Ted Cruz say that they suspect that they'll have enough states covered by July, which is exactly one month prior to our march on Washington demanding that very same thing. I can think of no good reason why we shouldn't be able to set aside emotions and I don't care if they racist, that don't matter to me. What's at stake is is very, very important and you know who's to say that hey, they don't come out of that thing and the whole United States is now in the Confederate States of America. You know what I'm saying? So let's get out right. our emotions. It looks like this is going to happen and we could either be standing outside with our junk in our hand or and, and yelling with signs and or we could be in there in the halls of power getting something done. Right. And this is a call to our legislators across America. You need to be aware of this and you need to get on top of this. You need to start putting what we would like to see as far as any changes in writing and submitting it and then adding your voice to this call for a convention of states. It could be one of those very rare occasions where we work together with people across the aisle who we normally would not want to work with in order to achieve a common goal. Right, right, Max. It's very important. And also, not just to get our goal of abolishing slavery on the table, but to be there to oppose any amendments that would be harmful. Right. right. Imagine that. Because these people are openly calling for slavery. We heard, heard Jan Michelson, Mickelson call out specifically for that in 2016 during the presidential elections. Imagine if he was sitting up there with his little amendments in hand and his legislators to back those amendments. Uh, you know, anything is possible. In and, a, a, and I will a, point a, a out that if they reject our participation, then we could rightly label this as a convention of white supremacists to steal our liberty and freedom. Right, right. Well, Scotty, it's uh, 20 minutes before the top of the hour and the end of the program. It's probably time for us to get on our uh, regular scheduled segments. Yes, sir. Uh, if you want to know anything more about the Convention of States, just go to New Abolitionist Radio on Facebook. We've provided several links where you can go right to their website and see what's going on. Um, I guess. I'm sorry, yes, Scotty. I was going to say I have an abolitionist. Um, but um, where, wherever you, whichever segment you want to start with. Well, we normally go with our rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad and then our abolitionist. So let's just follow what we've okay. done. Okay. Let me find the writer. Who is our writer? Uh, I have it pulled up here. It's a former death row inmate goes free after acquittal, and it's Isaac McCoy. Uh, I will put it on New Abolitionist Radio, so you'll have it right there available for you. Just give me a second. And. It is posted. Okay, I am navigating there, and uh, while I do that, you can have the uh, rebellion, our uh, rebellion, slavery rebellion, and then after, <laughs> and then after for you, freedom's sake, yes, yeah, sir. for freedom's sake, and uh, then after that, I'll do the abolitionist in profile, 
which would be Reverend Bueller. All right. Okay, uh, come on, uh, comp- uh, Facebook, load up now. Yeah, th- for some reason it won't load anything just this, other than the straight link. There's no image, so you, it's, it's the first link on New Abolitionist Radio, DelawareOnline.com, not guilty. Okay, I, I see it, Max, I got it. Um, DelawareOnline.com, a former death row inmate goes free after acquittal. Uh, Isaiah McCoy, a death row prisoner for years, walked out of the Howard R. Young Correctional Institution in Wilmington, a free man, after a judge found him not guilty of murder in his second trial. It has a video report here that um, is going to start. So let's go ahead and and get this video report from DelawareOnline.com about um, Mr. McCoy wonder if he is um, a descendant of Elijah McCoy, the real McCoy. All right, come on now. Okay. Okay, here we go. Come on, Delaware Online. Stop acting crazy. Isaiah McCoy. I don't know how you're feeling right here we go. at this moment, walking out of the prison. Glorious. Um, did you think you'd get to this point? Absolutely. Explain to me what, what it feels like. Uh, God delivered me on my prayers ran I cried to my Lord for justice and he uh he gave it to me. I would like to introduce myself to the world. And uh I think there's a lot of others just like myself. I'm not alone. Uh, in my innocence. There's a lot of other people that deserve justice. Uh, Emmett Taylor, um, Tiba Mayfield, uh, Chauncey Starlin, just to name a few. Uh, but I think that the time is now uh, for, for the youth, for the people in my age group, uh, to become a part of uh, the new movement, the new case system, being uh, mass incarceration. What do you plan to do tonight, <laughs> your first night of freedom? Um, spend some time with my daughter and uh, just let it all sit in. You know, giving myself some time, mm-hmm. and then uh, I'll be ready to tackle the world. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to say? Um, I just want to say to all those out there that's going through the same type of thing I'm going through, mm-hmm. just to keep the faith and keep fighting, mm-hmm. keep fighting, because uh, two years ago I was on death row. You know, at, at 25, I was given a death sentence and a death date. And here I am today, alive. Alive and well, kicking in a free man. All right, so that was Mr. McCoy. Uh, let me uh, stop this. Just trying to play another video. Uh, let me see if I... Welcome to freedom, brother. Yeah, wel- welcome to uh, freedom. So let me see if I can get to details. He was accused of, of shooting a man to death during a drug deal in a rear parking lot of Rodney Village Bowling Alley on May 4, 2010. The deal was supposed to be for 200 ecstasy pills and crack cocaine, but during the transaction, McCoy pulled out a gun and shot Mumford, according to prosecutors. A jury found McCoy guilty in 2012, but the Delaware Supreme Court later overturned his conviction and death sentence. The court did so because former Deputy Attorney General and more attorney generals uh, R. David Favita belittled McCoy and lied to a judge during the death penalty trial the court said uh, Favita made demeaning comments about McCoy's choice to represent himself such as I have been to law school your honor I understand the rules and the trouble with dealing with somebody with a limited education and no legal education is he doesn't clearly understand what he's reading according to court documents. Favita also while in the presence of McCoy doing a court recess spoke about or murder an Italian mafia code of silence. Favita said he would put a detective back on the stand to tell everyone that McCoy was a snitch and added that McCoy could have trouble back in prison after the other inmates learned he is a snitch, the document said. McCoy alerted the judge to the comments, but Favita denied them. Then the uh, pro-notary 
I guess this is a notary who was in the room and overheard Fabata's comments was disturbed that Fabata lied to the judge and wrote a note saying McCoy was telling the truth. Fabata eventually admitted the comments were meant to be heard by McCoy according to the documents. The judge attempted multiple times to rein in his behavior, the prosecutor's behavior, but it was not until July 2015 that Fabata was suspended from the bar for six months and one day for what the court called unprofessional conduct. Fabata had already retired from the state in March of that year. So, well, you heard his story. Mr. McCoy is out. Welcome to freedom. And I just want to say this to somebody and and I don't they didn't say it to me in a derogatory way or, or anything they weren't trying to be confrontational they were just sharing their thoughts with me and this is something that has been said in the black community by certain people in our community who say that you know we're fools for uh uh, uh launching any kind of legal action to to get police or anybody to stop abusing us and to recognize our human rights our constitutional rights as citizens of this country and I asked that person you know so you saying that you know it's foolish to go into the enemy's court seeking justice I said well you know tell that to the hundreds of men and women who were on death row who are now out because the innocence project went to court to prove their freedom so I just wanted to say that I believe in by like Malcolm X said by any means necessary and as we again say on this program death by a thousand paper cuts whatever I got to do to get justice then that's what I will do Max yes sir Scotty uh, most recent reports that I'm aware of is one out of every 25 people on death row are innocent one out of every 25 so you tell wow. me, other than the courts, and and short of you know, uh, um, uh, storming, freaking the prison and shooting it out and shooting our way into the prison to free these people from death row, uh, then you tell me uh, what other option do we have other than to go through the courts? Yes, sir. Well, I guess uh, again, salute, welcome to freedom, brother. Should I go on to our uh, rebellion? Yes, sir. All right, indeed. Uh, Today is our new segment. We've been doing now for several weeks, uh, a history of rebellion for freedom's sake. And today we remember the German coast uprising of 1811. It's regarded by some historians as the largest revolt of its sort in American history. While that claim has been disputed, recent examinations of the period reveal that the revolt was a significant one. It took place in New Orleans, in a region east of the Mississippi River that was home to several sugar plantations and was led by a man of Haitian descent named Charles de De Londis. Differing accounts say that de Londis was either a slave or a slave driver, while others say he might have been born a free person. What is generally agreed upon is that de Londis planned and led the revolt. The uprising began on January 8th with at least 200 to more than 500 slaves taking up basic arms such as farm tools and whatever they could find to enter the plantation homes of the families that owned and abused them. The revolt revolt began at the Manuel Andre Plantation. De Londes and his men raided the home, taking the weapons and uniforms. De Londes was hopeful that success there would rally others to their cause. Despite the various language and cultural barriers between the slaves, their goals were clear. The carnage the slaves inflicted attracted the attention of local authorities, and a brief but intense war broke out. Considering the odds and their limited resources, academics who reviewed old records discovered that the revolt was far was more far-reaching than originally thought. In the end, almost 70 blacks were killed in battle, compared with just two whites, one of which was Andrew's son. Several dozen other slaves were executed or exiled from New Orleans. Some were decapitated and had their heads displayed on spikes. Other slaves, despite their participation, were too valuable to masters to be killed and were returned to their plantations. De Londe was tortured, shot, and then burned for his role. De Londe's revolt 
was inspired by the Haitian Revolution just a decade prior. In 2011, Destrehan Plantation and Tulane University commemorated the 200th year anniversary of the uprising. The German coast area is now the St. Charles and St. John the Baptist parishes. Despite its size, the area has no historical markers of the event and documentation of it is minimal. But we did manage to find a sign that marked that event in that place and it was on our promotional material for today's program. And here today we remember the German Coast Slave Uprising of 1811. Salute. Salute, brother. Salute, indeed. And with that, our final uh, segment for the evening will be our abolitionist in profile provided by Scotty Reed. Okay, our abolitionist in profile will be the extraordinary uh, Reverend Anthony Bewley. And we have talked about him in the past, and, you know, there's only so many abolitionists, so we do recycle them from time to time just to remind us. I got to ask you something. Um, so, Reverend Bewley, um, he was the son of John G. and Catherine Bewley, born in Tennessee, May the 22nd at 1804. Um I'm going, he was a respected minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church South. He was murdered by a mob at, in Fort Worth, Texas on September the 13th, 1860 for his abolitionist views. His death made him a martyr and was one among the most inflammatory acts leading up to the Civil War. The following story of his abduction and lynching is from the Methodist Episcopal Church history. Anthony Bewley was an abolitionist Methodist minister, the son of John Bewley, a Methodist preacher. From 1829 to 1834, he served the Methodist church as a circuit riding member of the Holston Conference of Virginia. In 1834, he married Jane Winton of Rowan County, Tennessee. In 1837, the Bewleys moved to Polk County, Missouri. And six years later, Bewley resumed his circuit riding ministry and joined the Missouri Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. When the church divided over the issue of slavery in 1845, the Missouri Conference voted to join the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Bewley was among the anti-slavery members of the conference who refused to accept this decision and chose instead to remain in what they considered to be the true Methodist church. By 1848, these Methodists had reorganized into the Missouri Conference of the Northern Church, though many still referred to themselves simply as members of the Methodist Episcopal Church. By 1858, after serving for 10 years in northern Arkansas, Texas, and Missouri, Bewley had moved his family to Johnson County, Texas, and established a mission 16 miles south of Fort Worth. Although he was considered to be weak on the slavery issue by some northern Methodists, his anti-slavery views were threatening to southerners. Thus, when vigilance committees alleged in the summer of 1860 that there was a widespread abolitionist plot to burn Texas towns and murder their citizens, suspicion immediately fell upon Bewley and other outspoken critics of slavery. Special attention was focused on Bewley because of an incendiary letter dated uh, July 3rd, 1860 addressed to Reverend William Bewley and supposedly written by a fellow abolitionist, William H. Bailey. Many argued that the letter which ur urged Bewley to continue with his work in helping to free Texas from slavery was a forgery. The letter was widely published however and taken by others as evidence of Bewley's involvement with the John Brown Ice in Texas. Recognizing the danger, Bewley left for Congress, Kansas and in mid July in mid July with part of his family en route. He stopped for eleven days in Indian Territory to wait for the remainder of his family and later visited with his wife's relatives in Benton County, Arkansas. On the third of september eighteen sixty, a Texas posse caught up with him near Cassville, Missouri. His captors returned him to Fort Worth on september thirteenth. Late that night, vigilante seized Bewley and delivered him into the hands of a waiting lynch mob. His body was allowed to hang until the next day when he was buried in a shallow grave. Three weeks later, his bones were unearthed, stripped of their flesh, 
and placed on top of Ephraim Daggard's storehouse where children made a habit of playing with them. At the Bewley's death, the Northern Methodists ended their activities in Texas. Uh, New Abolitionist Radio salutes the martyr uh, Reverend Anthony Bewley. Salute. Love hearing about these brothers and sisters who have fought in every way you can imagine to end slavery. Um, unfortunately, they were not completely successful because of the deception of the 13th Amendment, and that's why we're here today. And with your help, we can make a change and get this done for now and for always. Scotty, um, any final comments before we close out the program tonight? We got um, three minutes. Yeah, um, I, I don't really have a whole lot to say except for if Slavery and human trafficking isn't at the top of your list of issues that need to be addressed in the United States. You need to get your priorities straight. Exactly. And I guess I'll say this. Um, I posted it to New Abolitionist Radio so you can have the information available to you. The Millions for Prisoners March on Washington, D.C., August 19th, is one of our best opportunities to make permanent change if you have not already added your support uh, to this cause and declared that you will be attending, now is a good time to do so. And I also want you to remember probably the most important thing. Abolition. The abolition of slavery is a reason for a revolution. So we can finally know some peace. Peace. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Just lift your eyes up, let your eyes rise up, see the signs of the times if it's time. Rise up, rise up, when death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves.